How's it going, shipmates and future shipmates? Today, we're going to be talking with ET1 Kevin Bonilla, answering your questions about the ET rating being underway in the Coast Guard as a whole. So stay tuned. How are you doing, ET1? Good. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. So, right on. why don't you tell me about, uh, why did you join the Coast Guard and choose to go ET? Why did I join the Coast Guard? Okay, so, I joined in 2008. At the time, I was uh, going to college. I had about a year of college done. It was uh, not a very good time economy-wise. We were during that recession, so uh, I, I needed a source of income. I had no chance of finding meaningful employment. So I looked at the military as an opportunity to learn a trade and serve our country. I went ET because I've always liked computers, technology, that kind of stuff. And I was going to college for electrical and electronics. So it just, uh, it made sense. It happened to be that at the time ET was critical. So really worked out for me. <laughs> so uh, I was company Yankee 179er. What company were you? Tango 180. Okay. So, what month did you go in? Uh, I joined in June of 2008. So it was probably pretty hot, right? Oh, it was crazy at boot camp. We had so many days where it was over 100 degrees. You joined in the winter, right? Well, the first parts of November was nice, but then like there would be ice on the, <laughs> on the deck, so it got cold fast. <laughs> So why don't you tell me a little bit about your Coast Guard career and where you've been? All right, so I've been a lot of places. Bear with me. I <laughs> uh, graduated from boot camp in, in 08. Uh, from there, I attended a school in Petaluma, California, and I graduated in 2009. So my school was six months, but I was there two months early, so I just worked with the MAA staff. Um, out of A school, I chose Cutter Morgenthau, which was based out of Alameda, California at that time. Before I went to my first unit, first real unit, I had to go under extensive pipeline training. So I was in San Diego for two years. I was uh, working out of ESD San Diego, that's Electronic Support Detachment, while I was attending these schools. So. I eventually graduated CEWA school, got the plaque from Raytheon, I was valid Victorian, that was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, went to my unit, reported April 2011, uh, got short toured there. So I was, I was on Morgenthau for two years and then we had, a, we had a crew swap with the cutter Jarvis. So both of those cutters are both 378 feet. Ours was based out of Alameda, theirs was based out of Honolulu, Hawaii. So. We met up in LELB, did a crew swap. They sailed Morgenthau to Hawaii while we decommissioned Jarvis in Alameda. Uh, since I was short toured, I had to put in new picks. I wanted to stay in the Bay Area, so I got used to Alameda, where I was there for three years. Um, kind of wanted to go back to a boat, and I wanted to be in Hawaii, so I put in for early afloat. And I happened to get my number one, which was Morgenthau again. But this time, I would be working with operations, so communication and navigation instead of uh, weapon systems, CWIS. Um, yeah, so I, I put down Morgenthau and Sherman, both out of Honolulu, and got Morgenthau. Um, so I transferred out of Alameda 2016. Got to Morgan 2016, but again I got a short tour, so I hadn't I've only completed one real tour, I get to that <laughs> later, but so from Morgantha I was there from sixteen to seventeen, only a year. Uh, since I was transferring, I wasn't ready to leave Hawaii. I put in for early afloat. I got my number one for third time in a row. I got Cutter Kimball out of Honolulu, Hawaii as well. This was a pre commissioning unit. We were the first Wimsel in Hawaii. So um, I was there for three years, 
back to weapons. But uh, on Wimzo, it's a little different. We do, I do primarily weapons, but I'm still responsible for navigation and communication. So definitely, definitely a lot of uh, cross pollination there, and as far as ET work, pretty busy. Um, I just left this year from Kimball. I transferred to an FRC, also out of Honolulu, Hawaii. Fourth time I got my number one pick, so detailers seem to like me. <laughs> and yeah, I got there this May, and uh, so far so good. We were actually uh, in A school at the same time, but the first time we met was when I was a specialized decom crew on the Jarvis, and you were stationed on there, uh, doing the decommissioning also. Yes. And then uh, we went on. I recognized you. <laughs> we went on to be stationed together on the Morgenthau and then the Kimball. Uh, and Kimball, yeah. Can't get away from it. Oh, I can't shake you, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I'm coming there next. <laughs> so, uh, why don't you tell me, what was your favorite unit and why? Definitely ESD San Diego because it was a small base, it was a small AOR, um, and it was very close to family. So, it was a two hour drive to LA instead of a six hour drive from the Bay Area or six hour flight from Hawaii. So, uh, at least we're like still on the same uh, coast or still by Pacific Ocean. So, uh, I, could be worse, but uh, yeah, I definitely like being close to family. Yeah, I remember being stationed out at uh, ESD San Diego. I was there for almost a year before I started uh, Seawood School, and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the work out there. That's a really great yeah. unit overall. So, great unit, great town. Yeah. Oh, I loved going out in that town. Just the food out there was absolutely amazing. Uh, so tell me, what's an average day like for you in the Coast Guard? Uh, it's kind of a difficult question because it really depends on where you are and what you do. So I'll just speak from like what I know. And I've been to you know two ESDs and large and small cutters. So uh, sure free tees, you're probably going to be at a electronic support detachment, which involves every day you're going to drive to a unit, such as a small cutter like an 87 or 110, or you're going to drive to a small boat station, surf station. Um, we also have a lot of communication and navigation high sites, so these are places that aren't manned, but we just go, go there and do maintenance every day. On a cutter, it's pretty nice. Um, we work chop hours in port, so uh, we'll eat breakfast, start work at 6.45 or 7, and then uh, typically in port, we'll do maintenance, preventative and corrective. We'll take care of shop projects. We'll order a bunch of stuff. So just getting ready for our next underway or deployment. Uh, and then we'll skip lunch. We won't have lunch till 1300. Uh, we'll eat, and then from there, if our work's done, we go home. If not, we just stay till it's done, and usually it works out. It's, yeah. Okay, so it's a yeah, it's a great opportunity to kind of spend time with family while being at a deployable unit. Yeah. So I don't know if a lot of other services have that like we have it. So <laughs> I'm thankful for that. It is really nice having those trop hours and being able to get home at 1 p.m. each day. Uh, yeah, I kind of don't want to tell family that, like, yeah, I'm just working till one. <laughs> you earn it, though. You, you definitely earn it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, underway, uh, yeah, this is the other part of underway is uh, um, your work day is underway. It depends. For me, was, you know, you still keep doing maintenance because there's a lot of work that goes with Seawiz. Sea sorry. And there's a lot of uh, systems to maintain on board a large cutter, so... Uh, underway, you'll work eight hours of maintenance, and then we're on call, so we'll fix stuff throughout the night as it breaks, and stuff always breaks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not too bad. So on a small cutter, it's uh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, continue, please. Yeah, so small cutter is a little different. It's a, a lot less routine. It's a lot more random tasking. So. Um, we'll get a lot of tasking from our sectors to um, check out this target, go board them, or we have an active search and rescue case, like go here at these coordinates and do this search pattern. So it's, um, 
you just got to be ready. Yeah, definitely. So you've been on, on large cutters, you've been on small cutters, you've been on land units. Can you talk a little yes. bit about like the shop size and just like shop cohesion? Yeah, I really like the 378s, the Hamilton class, just because we were stacked for people. So uh, that that platform specifically separated weapons and operations. So you were kind of more specialized in what you do. Uh, Wimsel is getting a lot better. Before it was a pretty anemic shop, but they've listened to a lot of the complaints. So now we're getting more and more people that we kind of should have had, but now we have these people to help support all of the systems, and it's it's a lot, definitely. Um, on a small cutter, there won't be a lot, so it's me and another ET from my current unit, and uh, we are the technical authority. We're responsible for all the maintenance and operations of our equipment. Like, uh, so you you just gotta know your stuff. On a larger cutter, I always went to, hey chief, how do we do this, this, and that. Here, like I have to know my stuff. Yeah. So, what's the coolest thing that you've done on board a cutter? My favorite is I really like doing uh, helicopter operations. So, on the 378s and the Wimsel, I was helo tie down. So, we basically tie down the helicopters to the deck when they land, take take them off when they got to depart. Um, we do a lot of training, so we'll, uh, like have a simulated load that they got to, that we got to attach to a helicopter. So it'll be above us like six feet. It's pretty gnarly. Uh, we'll also fuel them while they're in midair. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty intense. I, I particularly like working with Jayhawks just cause the rotor wash is insane and it's a lot of fun trying not to get knocked down. <laughs> <laughs> while trying to fuel this thing in midair. So you're actually going under but, uh, coolest thing the spinning I, blades. Yeah, you're you're underneath you are underneath the helicopters, you get hazard pay. Oh nice. It's a fast paced rewarding kind of collateral duty, yeah. Uh but but for uh these uh Alpats we do, these uh bearing sea patrols, I thought it was really nice. Well, it was difficult at the time but We'd get search and rescue cases at like two in the morning, so it's it's rough seas, it's blistering cold and snowy, and we have to launch this helo. Like it was, uh, it's very challenging, but also very rewarding being able to do something like this. To me, it felt like wow, this is this is the real Coast Guard. This is what we're here for, you know? Yeah, I remember doing some of those with you as uh, I was the fire team member on the Morgenthau when we had a couple of those search and rescue cases pop up, and. I still have to say, Definitely. the best part about an Alpat is going to get the milkshakes at Amelia's in Dutch Harbor. A lot of Dutch Harbor, yeah. <laughs> so, what's the best port call you've been to? I've been to a lot, but I think my personal favorite is Panama. Just because, uh, so they, they, their currency is the... U.S. dollar, so you don't have to worry about conversion like you do with Costa Rica, Mexico. Um, they have a lot of great seafood and steak restaurants there. They have very large malls, so it's it's very there's a lot of convenience there. So you can buy like protein powder, games, music, electronics, all this stuff to kind of keep you occupied on your free time underway. So okay, I always like going to Panama. Yeah, I, I remember going yeah. with you, and it was a uh... It was a great time. What advice? Definitely. That's where I got a. Uh, was it Pokemon? Yeah, the yeah, new Pokemon yeah. that came uh, out. We were there the for that. Pokemon Let's Go. That's where we got it. Yep. What advice would you have for someone that's interested in becoming an ET? Advice for someone becoming an ET. So don't worry about like not knowing a lot about electronics or computers. Um, the A schools and C schools, they'll get you that basic understanding. And in the fleet, particularly afloat, you'll learn so much more. So you just got to put in your time. Uh, don't be worried about how complex these systems are or how much there actually is. So what would you say would be the best unit for somebody uh, who just became an ET to go to? 
I would recommend definitely choosing the float as your first unit, just because you'll you'll learn so much more of float. I think because you're you're on call twenty four seven. It's just just you and maybe a few other people. So okay. I, I noticed when I was uh, pipelining out of San Diego, and when I was when I was stationed in Alameda, like the the superstar ETs, they always came from cutters. So I think you really learn your stuff there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have any parting shots for anyone who's interested in joining the Coast Guard? Yeah. So uh, when I joined, it was uh, I wish I would have joined out of high school to be honest. Like. I knew I wanted to do electronics and you wanted to go to college, but I didn't, I wasn't ready for that yet. Uh, so I wish I would have just learned the trade sooner. And the Coast Guard will give you, you'll get that trade, you'll get work and experience, which is big for companies. I mean, what good is a degree without experience? And you'll earn a GI Bill. So you'll have trade experience and then here, go to college and get your degree. And you can also get degrees while you're in. So I would say if you're undecided on what you want to do or kind of want to get on a fast track to your career, I would recommend enlisting. Okay. I just want to say thank you to ET1. Thank you for uh, being the first interview in this series. And I want to say... Really? <laughs> if you have any... No pressure. <laughs> if anybody has any comments or questions, feel free to hit me up in the comments below. Or hit me up on any of my social media accounts, Fairwinds, and Following Seas.